morning. My name is Deacon Charles Matthews with uh, Fountain of Faith Baptist Church located at 7887 Beechnut, Houston, Texas, 77074. You can reach us on our uh, website, fofbchouston.org. And uh, we will be glad to either hear from you or even see you. So our Sunday school lesson we're going to be talking about this morning is entitled, One King Over All. The lesson is found in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 15 through 25. And before I decide to go any further, we always want to make sure to even get on the right path or to stay on the right path, we have to go to the Lord in prayer. So let us go to our Lord and Savior in prayer this morning. Let us remember 1 John 1 and 9 where God said in his word that if we would just confess our known sins, that he would be faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalms 66 and 18 says that if I would regard iniquity in my heart, that God would not hear my prayers. Let us take time out now as we approach the throne of grace to ask for forgiveness for a thought that might have run across our mind, a word that might have came out of our mouth that just wasn't Christ-like. Dear God, as we uh, come to you this morning, dear Lord, to uh, expound, intake, and enjoy and feast on your holy word, we want to thank you, dear Lord, for your, your mercy and your grace that you've given us thus far, dear Lord, during this uh, pandemic, oh gracious master. Dear Lord, uh, the words of thank you for just one more day, dear Lord, seem to be Words that come alive each and every day when we wake up and see another sunrise. So we just want to thank you for that day, Lord. We say a special prayer of the Lord for the uh, family members of the Lord of the church. We say a special prayer, of mem uh, prayer for the ones that are listening to this Sunday school lesson, Lord. We ask that the Holy Spirit might come into their homes, come into their hearts, dear Lord. And let this word come alive to them, dear Lord as you have let it come alive to us. In Jesus' name, let us say, amen, amen. Okay, once again, the title of our lesson is One King Over All. And even today, I know uh, it doesn't seem like it, but there is one king over all, even today. So our lesson is found in Ezekiel 37, 15 through 25. And our lesson outline says, uh, a prophetic sign for the nation. And our second outline is a prophetic promise for the nation. And our golden text reads as it says, And David my servant shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall all walk in my judgment and observe my statutes and do them. That's Ezekiel 37 and 20. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance to explain that a little bit more in detail, what the word of the Lord is saying. Our scripture reads as thus follows. In uh, the prophetic sign for the nations, starts at Ezekiel 37 and 15, where it says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Moreover, son of man, take thee, one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel his command, companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim for all the house of Israel and his companion. And join them one to another in one stick and they shall become one end. Thou hand. So what we have here is a prophetic 
sign for the nations. And y'all, I guess uh, most Christians have heard the story about the dry bones. Ezekiel was the prophet with the dry bones. And that, that was back in uh, 37 and 1, where God said, where Ezekiel said, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. That was the, the vision that God gave to Ezekiel about the dry bones. He was putting it in Ezekiel's heart to let him know that if these bones can live, just like these bones can live, so will the nation of Israel live and thrive also. So he's speaking to Ezekiel again in 37 and 15, and he said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying again. So the first time it just was Ezekiel and the Lord. The second time now is the Lord Ezekiel, and he's speaking to the uh, tribes of Judah. In our introduction, one of the main points about our introduction, what well, I forget, is that it talks about two groups of people. It talks about the Jews and a group that's called the Romanese people. And the amazing thing about these two groups of people was is that they both suffered. They both was in concentration camps during, the, during that time. But the, the thing is about them is that they both through trials and tribulation and captivity, they maintained and kept the ethnic identity. So the thing is, is that even through all of this, the Jews and these other Romani people kept the ethnic identity because one of God's rules was for the Jews that they shouldn't marry into any other race. But the thing is, is that they were able to remain as one in all those trials that they went through. So God is letting them know that now that they, they are still one people, here they're in captivity now, but they are still one people. And he's letting them know what's going to happen to them. He says, so by these two sticks he's talking about, Israel had become divided. And the reason why they become divided is found in uh, Ezekiel 12, 1 through 24. I'm going to have to just explain that, but you can read it on your own. The reason why they had became divided was because when King Solomon was building the temple and he was building his homes, but he was also it took a lot of money, so the people were being overtaxed. So the people went to Solomon had passed and went to Jeroboam, his son, asking for some relief. Well, Jeroboam didn't release them. He wanted to put more taxation on them. But the reason that uh, even though the, they separated for taxation purposes, the real reason why they was, I shouldn't say the real reason because taxation was a part of it. But the second or the first cause was because of the sin of Solomon. Back in uh, 1 Kings, uh, I think chapter 11, 31 through 33, God told Solomon that he was going to take the kingdom away from him because Solomon had started serving other gods. By him marrying all these women and serving their gods, he was serving a god called the god of Kumash. And they even believed in child sacrifice. So the thing is that God had said that he was going to divide the kingdom. One of the things I like to kind of inject here is that uh, we always say that God said, and that's it, and I believe it. Well, that's true too. But God did say that the kingdom would be divided. They didn't have to be divided right then and there. The thing is, is like when uh, God told Jonah to go tell Nineveh 
that uh, they was going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days, and the king repented and prayed. Nineveh was eventually destroyed, but 150 years later. So the thing is, what I'm saying here is that in this plan of God, prayer has power. Even in Ezekiel, in uh, Hezekiah was one of the kings, and uh, Isaiah, God told Isaiah to go talk to him and tell him he was going to die. Well, he went and he talked to him. He told him and what, what Hezekiah did. He got on his knees. He repented. He prayed to the Lord. And look, God's word is true. Yes, he died. But God gave him an extra 15 years later. So what I'm saying here, what I'm saying is, is that prayer is powerful. And we should neglect the opportunity to use it. Because even today, like these two sticks that God is using as a demonstration of Israel to divide it, that's just like us today. Our financial life, our social life are two different sticks. They separate it. The thing is, is that we don't know when or how. It won't, re it won't re remain forever. But maybe we could bring them back a little bit faster if we would pray for some relief. So I'm just letting you know, prayer, there's power in prayer, and we should use it even during times such as these. So, God had told Ezekiel to write on one stick the tribe of Judah, which was the southern kingdom, and then he told him to write on the other stick uh, Ephraim, and Ephraim was a descendant of Joseph. The reason why the, the Israel was referred to sometimes, which was the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, as Ephraim, because Ephraim was the larger tribe. Then Judah, which was the southern kingdom, was referred to as Judah a lot of times, since this was the larger of the tribes. But God had already said that he was going to take ten tribes, but he was going to leave two, because for his sake and for David's sake. And when it was divided... Israel went into sin. They went into sin immediately when the tribes uh, separated. You can find that in 1 Kings also, I think around chapter 18, to tell you why, even though they were separated of sin and out of God worship, is why they went into captivity. Later on, Judah did the same thing because of sin and out of God worship, then they went into captivity. So he Ezekiel is talking to the tribes of Judah here in Babylon. And he, God has told them to give them a demonstration. And the demonstration is of these two sticks. And the thing is, I was thinking about these sticks. I don't believe it was just, he just took two sticks and just laid them side by side. Because that wouldn't really be joining. I'm thinking that it might be more like he probably took these two sticks and maybe he was grafting them. Because see, when you graft something together, that's when you kind of shave off of each one and bind them together. When they get through, it's like one. He was doing this, and not only was he was doing it out in front of the people, he wasn't explaining what he was doing. So naturally, God had an answer for what the people was. He knew the people was going to ask the question. So God gave Ezekiel an answer. And uh, he, here it is, it says in the second part, a prophetic promise for the nation. These two sticks is an example of a prophetic promise for the nation where God is demonstrating to the southern kingdom, which is Judah, and the uh, northern kingdom, which is Israel, that they are going to be John back together. So God is telling Ezekiel when the people ask. When the people ask, this is found in 19, say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the sticks of Judah, 
and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thy hand before thy eyes. So what he's actually saying, these two sticks will represent the nation, the divided nation of Israel, and also they are in a desolate, destitute, hopeless, like, like those dry bones. They are dry sticks. But God said he, just like he revived those dry bones, he's going to revive the nation of Israel and make them one nation again. So God is using the prophet of uh, Ezekiel to explain to the people his will for him. You know, it, it was disobedience that uh, caused them to go, uh, disobedience and false idol worship caused them to go in disobedience into uh, captivity. But God is making a way for them to be joined back again and bring them out. He's going to make them the great nation that they was before Solomon's time, in David's time, the great nation that they was. He said, and say unto them, Thus said the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathens, whether they go, whether they be gone, and will gather them over every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel and one king. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be one, shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore. So, when the people ask Ezekiel, what are you doing? And God told Ezekiel, tell them, they're going to be one nation again. The Bible is filled with, quite, with uh, many prophecies. And one of the prophecies is, many relate to the first coming of uh, Jesus Christ. The thing is about the uh, Bible prophecies, and the thing is that could give the people the faith and give the people hope was, is because of the things that have already happened. The things that have already come to pass. Like the promise of a Savior, Jesus Christ. When he came and made a way for him to be saved, when Christ came into the world to die on the cross so that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have El eternal life. So God is telling them what's the meaning of these two sticks. He they have been reminded what God had did for them before. They know God had brought them out of Egypt. Brought them through the Red Sea. Set them up a kingdom of the David. A great kingdom under Solomon. He had did all these things. So now if they could just remember what the Lord had done for them. And just look at these two sticks that God is putting together. Saying that they're going to make him, that he's going to make them one nation again. A great nation. That's the hope. That they are needed now while they are in captivity. Because when you're in captivity, there's a lot of hope and a lot of despair. Uh, even now, the days that we're in now, we're not in captivity. But there is some despair. So the thing is, God has promised them that he's going to reunite, uh, reunite the nations again. And not only that, when he reunite them. This is what he's going to do for them. He said, Neither shall thou, they defile themselves anymore with idols. What he's going to do for them? He's going to clean them up. Not only is he going to clean them up, he's going to clean them out. The thing is, is when God they divided the nations and he gave them to Jeroboam, God told Jeroboam that he was going to give him those ten nations. Well, Jeroboam decided in his own heart, he didn't want, he wanted to make sure that Israel wouldn't go back and be rejoined 
with Judah because they had to go up for the feast once every year. So what Jeroboam did, he built two calves in different towns to where the people could come and worship and wouldn't have to go back to Jerusalem. So when I say that he's going to, evidently Jeroboam must have had some old sin nature back from the Egyptian days still in his heart. And he brought it out and called the southern kingdom to worship out of God. And then they went into slavery 200 years after their division. Judah went into slavery 150 years after uh, Israel did. So the thing is, when I say he's going to clean them up and clean them out, he's going to get that old sin nature out of you. And then he talks about here in verse 24. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgment and observe my statutes and do them. That's in, I know we've had a lot of talk about the uh, tribulation and the millennial reign. Some are probably familiar with it. Some are not. There's no way we could take the time to even... I mean, even the tribulation lessons could be four to six weeks. But God has made a way. He's put it on your mind. He's going to make a way if you want to learn more about it, that you will be taught. Just let the Lord know that you really want to know. And also, remember in Reunited, God has given these people hope, even though they might not, some of them are not going to see in Hebrews 11, see if I can find it here. Hebrews chapter 11, verses uh, 13, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, and we persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and the pilgrims on the earth. The thing is that the ones in the captivity, some of them didn't get a chance to go back to them. They wasn't reunited. The whole nation haven't been reunited yet, even though Israel was uh, established in uh, 1948 as a nation. They still haven't got all the land that God promised to them. So the thing is, is that even though they knew that they weren't going to receive the promise, they had the hope that the promise was coming. What Jesus said is going to be happening, just like we got to have a hope for today, that things are going to be as the Lord said. I know, I know things are not looking too good today. I know uh, you say, uh, where is the hope? Well, the hope is in that Ecclesiastes. Uh, there's a time for everything, meaning that this trouble won't last always. The hope is in that John 10 and 10, where Jesus said that I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Of course, now, this is not the abundant life right now, but the hope is that this is not going to remain the same. The hope is, is that God said is that we are going to have a joyful life because we are serving him with his word. And the thing is, is that the hope is, is that even when we're gone, we are still going to be coming back because in Revelation 20 and 6 where Jesus said, we must remember, however, that we, that we today whom are followers of Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, will enjoy the glories of his kingdom as well. Indeed, he will reign. Indeed, we will reign with him a thousand years. Uh, I understand because I want to enjoy John 10 and 10 now. So do you. So the thing is that I, I, my hope is and that I know is is that God is going to restore things back to the way they were before this uh, pandemic. When I say the way they were, I don't mean in the uh, sinful lifestyle that the way they were. In, in, in a sense that we might be able to recognize them more. You know, like today. You know, each day we can see the flowers and enjoy them more. Each day we see the sunshine and enjoy them more. 
So you see, before then, when everything was busting and the economy was booming, we didn't, we didn't have time to enjoy the flowers, to enjoy the sunshine. But now we do. But the thing is, God is going to put things back. He's going to give us back uh, an opportunity to go to the nursing home, a nice, an opportunity to uh, speak to the old folks at the nursing home, an opportunity to fellowship with family members again. We can have hope in that. Because even though we're just like those two sticks, we're going to be grafted back together again also. So just remember, God's plan is vast. It's eternal. I read, uh, I've heard it. It says, God's, the work is hard. The pay is low. And, but the retirement is out of this world. So the thing is, when we get back to the way we was, just remember, when we're working for the Lord, the work is hard, the pay is low, but the retirement is out of this world. There's a hope for us. With that in mind, I'd like to conclude there. I hope we was able to get something out of this uh, demonstration of Ezekiel with the two, the two sticks demonstrating that God will revive the nation of Israel and it gives us hope that God will revive America. I'd like to thank you for listening to me today. Once again, uh, we are located at uh, 7887 Beechnut in Houston, Texas. Found the Faith Baptist Church. Uh, we can be found on the website of FOFBC. And we just uh, pray that a uh, word of encouragement, a word of blessing, might have touched your heart today. Let us pray. Dear God, we uh, come this morning praying the Lord for our country. We pray for our leaders, the Lord. We pray, O oh, gracious Master, the Lord, that you will uh, let the scientists find the, uh, either the, the vaccine, the cure, or something that we can manage the situation with the Lord. You've done it before, and we know the Lord that you'll do it again. So we are just going to keep on moving the Lord with, uh, with that hope, O oh, gracious Master, that you're going to just make things better than what they are today. Thank you to the Lord. In Jesus' name, let us say, amen.